yes, he could plan to kill Mr. Ray, his neighbor, uh, but in his mind, the disease of his mind was because he felt he needed to do that because Mr. Ray was actually a bad person, the paranoia. In Matthew's case, he, he had paranoid delusions that Mr. Ray was going to do him serious harm, harm that he didn't want, and the only way to protect himself and make sure to, to get rid of this evil was to kill Mr. Ray. The National Institute of Mental Health, or the Office of Mental Health, estimates that under 1% of the U.S. population suffers from schizophrenia. Today, on The Silent Struggle, episode 15, my partner, co-host David Magnuson, and I, Robert Asensio, are speaking with Dr. Sherry Schwartz, once again, forensic psychologist, but we want to examine a case that led to murder. Homicide of two individuals in Miami-Dade County, a business owner, Mr. Barrow, and a neighbor who were trying to help the person suffering from schizophrenia who never had treatment. We want to go into what led up to the murder, the murder conviction, which Dr. Schwartz worked on, and we want to examine the, ba the forensic side of the case, take a look at the guy's mental health, the defendant, the subject, the convicted killer's mental health state. Welcome, doctor. How Thank are you? you? Thank you for having me. I'm great. How are you? I'm doing great. David? Great to have Dr. Schwartz back again. Thank and uh, I have you. my Christmas sweater on, so I'm, I'm ready to go. <laughs> good deal. Good deal. So, doctor, let, let's talk about the case, right? Okay. So this, uh, this incident occurred, for those of you following want to do research, the defendant's name, the convicted killer's name is Matthew Guzman. Mm -hmm. It occurred in in 2010, yes, am I correct? that's right. Um, late 2010, there were two murders. Then Guzman was arrested by a Miami-Dade police officer. Mm -hmm. As he was walking the streets, it was sometime around the late night of the, uh, of the evening, he was pushing a shopping cart. And in that shopping cart, there was contents of soil, bags of soil, but he also had a backpack with him. So the officer stops him, asks questions. That question leads to an arrest because they discovered that Matthew had stolen the soil from a or search following the arrest revealed that he had a five, nine millimeter firearm. So the, the officer takes him down to the station thinking that maybe there's a little more here based on the subject's erratic behavior. And then detectives come and they speak to him and, and he admits, Guzman admits, to having killed the owner of a service center. Correct. Forensic analysis of the firearm ties the firearm and Matthew to a second homicide. That of a 64-year-old man, Mr. Ray, mm -hmm. who happened to be Matthew's neighbor. So he's arrested. Trial a case takes about 10 years to go to trial, right? Well, he gets convicted 10 years after the incident. So tell us about schizophrenia, how it played a role in this in this case, um, so we can get this conversation started. Sure. So schizophrenia is a psychotic disorder, and it manifests itself. Typically, we, we can see symptoms of it in somebody who's going to develop schizophrenia um, between the ages of sometimes even as young as 16, but typically between 18 up to the age of 30. So there are some cases before the age of 18. There are some after the age of 30, um, but the vast majority are, are somewhere in there. And the individual might function totally normally up until the time that they start to have these psychotic delusions. They can have hallucinations. Hallucinations might be auditory, so they hear voices. They might be um, visual hallucinations where they see things that aren't necessarily there, uh, what we call gustatory, where they have a taste that doesn't exist. You know, they'll describe tasting something in their mouth that 
you know, it's just mm -hmm. a delusion, a hallucination. Um, and in Matthew's case, his hallucinations were paranoid type. So he heard voices. He also had um, visual hallucinations where he saw things that weren't there. Um, but the thing in his case that seemed to drive the, the violent behavior was the auditory hallucination that he and the delusion that these two gentlemen, who were very nice to Matthew, they took an interest in him and wanted to help him, um, that he believed that they wanted to have what he called homosexual sex with him and that he was afraid. And so he resorted to violence. Yeah. So we see from the, from the um, police reports, right, that, that Matthew said he was left with no other choice. Did, did you see that, David, in the, in the uh, reference material? Yeah, and, and leads to the question, left with no other choice. How did it get from that point? First of all, we don't know exactly when it started, when he had these delusions or when he was going through, or, or do we? Well, we know a little bit. So he had been hospitalized in New York okay. uh, in like a 72-hour hold. Mm -hmm. And it didn't go much beyond that. And so he was given medication. But part of the problem is medication compliance in people with schizophrenia because the medications are awful. The side effects are awful. And so they don't like to take the medications. Mm -hmm. And that appeared to be the case here. What, what kind of side effects? If so, Super dry mouth, like mm -hmm. on steroids type dry mouth, okay. right? No matter, you can drink and drink and drink, you're never going to quench that thirst. Mm -hmm. um, very, very flattened affect. You know, you're almost like a zombie. And so they're really just really super unpleasant side effects. So it helps bring down the symptoms of the schizophrenia, the psychotic disorder, but it basically dulls your any essence you have for life. Because that's where, you know, the original question I have, but going back to yours, uh, he had no other choice. So how did it manifest from there? Because I think we can all make that, it's, it's not even an assumption, it's a fact that most people, mm -hmm. the majority of people going with schizophrenia are not violent. Correct. Okay. So something happened that brought him from point A to point B and, and to a very violent point B. Yes. So can we, great point, David, but can we go into... The definition of, I know you, you pretty much glanced over the definition of, of schizophrenia, but can we go into like the layman's translation of, well, how does it manifest itself? So you, you're, 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 let's say I have schizophrenia. God, I hope not. But uh, no. is it voices in your head? It can be. And yeah. there, and or you see things one? that aren't there. Yes. Multiple voices. And what's interesting is when... And in my, I've worked on well over 200 cases at this point in my career. There's only about four of those cases, Matthew being one, where I encountered someone who had psychotic disorder, schizophrenia. So this is on the lower side. Yes. M most individuals accused of homicide are perfectly able to have a conversation with you and understand the consequences of their behavior um, and to form the intent mm -hmm. to do the crime mm -hmm. that they're accused of doing. Um, so it is really, really low, right? And, and I think it's important to, to mention it, and you, you all do a great job of that, but to continue to remind people that somebody with a psychotic disorder is more likely to be victimized than to victimize others. But when it crosses over to violence and the person isn't medication compliant, Right. Mm -hmm. they, they for whatever reason, they don't think they need the medications. The medications are just wreaking havoc on their their body. Um, if they're not medication compliant and they have a predilection toward violence, this is a problem. It's a mm -hmm. safety issue. It's a safety issue for them. It's a safety issue for the community. And that was what happened here. Um, and so. With schizophrenia, what's interesting is there does seem to be a hereditary component, a genetic component. So that doesn't necessarily mean that your mom or your dad mm -hmm. has schizophrenia. But probably if you do the research, if you're able to mm -hmm. acquire records, things like that, you will find that somewhere in the genetic history, there was, you know, maybe that relative who was off. Mm -hmm. 
you know, um, and I, I use off with, mm -hmm. with air quotes because not everybody got the help for mental health in the way that it's more mainstream now. We recognize more now. Um, or you, they had a relative who was institutionalized and just was institutionalized in a mental health facility, what they used to call asylums, for their entire lives. Um, we didn't really find that, that the information wasn't available. Uh, Matthew's father wasn't in the picture. Matthew's mother was a working professional who, oh, she just broke my heart because she really worked very hard. She recognized that he wasn't well. She tried to get him help. Um, you know, the help basically props that person up with the medication, but then it's incumbent upon the patient who's not, he, this is somebody who's paranoid. They're not in their right mind to take care of their own care. And his mother really just did everything she could to work with him um, and was really gutted by what happened. Was he living on the streets? No, he was living at home. Okay. So he's a functioning person to some extent i don't know if it was you david or, or doctor that we were talking but one of you mentioned that by all accounts matthew was liked by many oh yeah very smart very talented artist um he was at, he is i i shouldn't talk about him in the past tense but i haven't seen him okay. in more than a decade um very gentle and kind the problem was in the mind, mm -hmm. you know, um, he suffered from psychotic delusions often. David, you saw, I, I, we were doing some research, right? As we do for, for these shows and, and, uh, we came across a video and you got to see it, uh, CNN, um, Anderson Cooper, Correct. he performed an exercise. You want to talk about that? Yeah, uh, yes. Oh, he had the headphones on. He's here getting voices, loud voices, soft, loud combination. Yes. And they're giving him some simple task, putting numbers in sequence, some words, and then they went to another thing. They went back to the words. And he at one point you can see he was he was he, aggravated a little bit, not at anybody in specific except himself. I can't do this. And you know, that was a perfect example of of what goes on in someone's head. Now, of course, this mm -hmm. was you know, put on, but it's the same thing. He's hearing voices. He can't get to, to the task at hand. And you have to feel for those that, you know, genetically, they can't, uh, they cannot do it either. They're just hearing different voices, um, you know, taking them in different directions. They can't complete tasks. So, yeah, you, you know, the medication could help. But we mm -hmm. keep hearing too sometimes, you know, with, with the side effects or, or other things. How many times do we get called to the house? Or, Can you help me out? You know, as law enforcement, he or she's not taking their medication. Yeah. And, and then sometimes we'd be on scene. They take it a few minutes later, like night and day. Mm -hmm. Everything was fine. Um, but you, you understand or you ha that exercise gave you an ability to understand what people may go through. And with Anderson's uh, response, you know, here's an intelligent, you know, functioning individual who in a you know, 10, 15 minute, 20 minute uh, exercise was frustrated. So yeah. you could only right. imagine the frustration. And the interesting thing was when he went out in the street. Correct. And got the newspaper. And yeah. He couldn't really r respond well. So, so the re I'm glad you brought up the part about when we responded to, when police respond to mm -hmm. scenes, right? Think about an officer responding to a scene or, or anyone seeing a person doing something that maybe they shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. And then you calling out to them and, and, and whether you're giving them commands or trying to rationalize with them, and they're just totally ignoring you. You may be one voice out of a many that right. are going on at that time, and, and right. he or she can't differentiate. It's um, – I know the, the simulation that you are referring to, it's actually one – there's there's a great video that I share with university students – um, put out by one of the drug companies that makes mm -hmm. one of the, the treating drugs. And just watching the video simulation, just watching mm -hmm. it, not even being in it, is very, it's, it's anxiety provoking because there's so much noise. And that's what a lot of people 
with psychotic disorders describe that it's not necessarily like we're having a conversation where one person takes a turn talking and you can process that and respond. It's noise. It might not even be clear voices that are saying like a police officer, stop, you know, put the weapon down, you know, hands behind your back or hands up in the air. I, I See, I'm telling people yeah. to put their hands behind their back. I could get them in trouble. Um, right. They're not able to, they might not be able to process that because there's so much noise going on in their brains. So in Matthew's case, let's go back to the case, right? Mm -hmm. Um, there's intent, right? Because so he believed, right. That, yes. that these men who I believe were trying to help him. Yes. At least one of them, uh, were trying – had ill feelings or had ill intent towards him. So he arms himself and in the case of his neighbor, it was discovered that he shot him multiple times before he put the final bullet in the guy's head, right? But point being is that there's evidence that he was able to plan this out, right? Yes. So, so you have at least the premeditation there. Let's talk about the case and in, in, because you played an instrumental role in the conviction of this defend or this this, this, this killer um, to ensure that he got the right treatment or the right sentencing. But talk about if you can the distinction between his illness, his ability to to plan, and then the crime. Okay. So it is really difficult to disentangle and to understand, even for pe mental health professionals, uh, how it is that someone who is so mentally ill is able to plan and carry out anything, let alone a violent act. Uh, but we know that many of these individuals can. We have this stereotype or image that these individuals are going to be people who We'll know them. We'll see them on the street and just know them by looking at them. And sometimes that's true. Sometimes you you can tell somebody who's really seriously mentally ill, but sometimes you can't unless you start talking to them. And they can seem to function like the rest of us um, until you start talking to them and you realize that they have ideas that aren't quite normal, right? Um, and so, yes, he could plan to kill Mr. Ray, his neighbor, uh, but in his mind, the disease of his mind was because he felt he needed to do that because Mr. Ray was actually a bad person, the paranoia. In Matthew's case, he, he had paranoid delusions that Mr. Ray was going to do him serious harm, harm that he didn't want, and the only way to protect himself and make sure to, to get rid of this evil was to kill Mr. Ray. And that was the same with, um, the, I can't Mr. remember. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow, yeah, at um, the auto body shop that gave him a job. You know, and it's interesting because Matthew appeared to know that it was wrong to kill and that he could get in trouble for killing. And this is why even though we were able to get a waiver of the death penalty because he was facing two death penalties mm -hmm. for the two murders when he was first charged uh, was because there were enough records. Um, even at the jail, the jail psychiatrist had to acknowledge that he was very seriously mentally ill and continued to have paranoid delusions um, about all kinds of things. About He listened to a radio show, a local radio show on AM radio, and he believed that the radio host was sending him messages, you know, and so it was a constant talking to him and reminding him and his mother would do the same. She would be going to visit him uh, and talking to him about, you know, the fact that he was ill and that he needed to know that he was ill. And um, he seemed to know that, but again, the paranoia kind of kept him from really totally accepting what anyone was telling him. So it was just a very sad case all the way around. So we, and, and I, I know that you as a, as a police, former police chief, command staff, city of Miami, uh, you were involved in some homicide cases and in, in, in at least your staff, right? Um, think about 
trying a case like that, right? Bringing the evidence for the for the prosecution to try the case, uh, and knowing that this guy was ill. Yeah, I mean, you're bringing the ca- the case, the evidence forward like you would any other case. Maybe in the back of your mind, I have never worked homicide. I've done robbery. Mm-hmm. That was that was my forte. But you have to know in the back of your mind, this this may end up the way it ended up because the person has issues and they're you know you're, they're being told, listen, this this person has some some serious concerns going on. But you know, I, I want to transition a bit over too, in viewing back in seventeen, I think when he was found guilty, when it finally came to fruition, the mm-hmm. case, um, the different family members, and I feel for them. I feel for his mother, but I mean the family members are the victims. Yeah. I mean, you got to look at the victims. What have they done? And at what point do you do you sort of say, oh, my gosh, I, this can happen to anybody. I mean, you're dealing with somebody that may be a little off. You don't know the extent. But in that person's mind, you are a threat to them. And out of the blue, for no reason, things like this could happen. That's scary. But what they did say, both families, in different ways, was he finally seems like he showed some remorse now. So during the time from the time of, of, of apprehension of going to trial to, to, to the time where it finally ended the trial, right? From 10 to 17, mm-hmm. he finally showed some remorse. That didn't bring anything. I don't think it helped them at all, but they did acknowledge he, it looked like he had some, some remorse. Now, did that come perhaps with any medication that could have come once he was in custody or something to aid him along that he was in a better place, that he, he can see things a little bit more clearly? I ask as a question. I, I don't know. Right. So my involvement in the case was limited to having getting the death penalty waived, if that was a possibility. Unfortunately, it was. So I was finished with this case probably around 2012, but even though the case went on, um, because I only dealt with death penalty at that time. And I can tell you that I spent a lot of time with Matthew very early on. And he would, um, the jail can't force medication, so you have to go to a mental health facility for that. Um, And he was in the jail, and so he very frequently was suffering from psychotic delusions and paranoid psychotic delusions. And he, um, he would go between this, I would say, not fully grasping what he did, but accepting that Mm -hmm. he did it. And that it wasn't a good thing that he did, but at the same time, also still feeling like he had to protect himself, you know, in that he could still be in danger from these men because they, he would see these auras of these men. Um, And so it was really, really deeply troubling, you know, because you want him to take the medication, um, but they can't force him to take medication if he doesn't want to. And even at that time, early on, he was very remorseful. He, he seemed to recognize a lot because his mother spent a lot of time talking to him about it, uh, that these men meant him no harm and that it was the disease of his mind that caused him to think the things that he was thinking. Was there any evidence of any prior instance of violence? Not that I found. Interesting. Not so he just, in layman's term, just snapped. I mean, I guess, you know, I don't think that the state fully accepts it as a snap. I, I would say his mind is diseased. And the reason I say that is because, mm-hmm. to me, when I think of snapped, I think somebody just goes off the rails and they don't know the difference between right and wrong, and they're not planning anything. It kind of happens okay. in the moment. That's that's how I conceptualize a snap. Um, and this seemed to have both murders seem to have an element of planning. You know, in Mr. Barrow's case, he waited until Mr. Barrow was alone. Mm-hmm. You know, he knew enough that he needed to do that. So he definitely was not in the right mind, but he was able, he was functioning enough that he could make a plan and execute that plan. And to some extent, he got away with it and would have probably continued to get away with it, except that there was excellent police work Mm -hmm. on the part of the officer that stopped him with that shopping cart. That officer had a sense 
that something was off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, I thought I had it in my notes, the officer's last name. But if anybody wants to read about this article, I mean about this case, Miami's Community News uh, featured the article in 2011 under the title Officer's uh, suspicious result, uh, Suspicion Results in Arrest. Officer Martinez. That's Officer right. Martinez. Yeah, he was on midnight patrol, yeah. which is where, you know. You and it was a hunch, right? He stopped the guy on a hunch. On a wagon going around. Suspicious. You know, it's, it's, yeah, it's synonymous a lot of times depending on what district you're in or if it's a warehouse district or what have you. But if you had bag soil or, for, you know, fertilizer walking around with it, it's obvious or it, it requires added investi- investigation. And that's the officer did a very, very sound job in following up on that. And the interesting thing about the credit to the officers is normally having gone through scenes and having made a number of arrests myself, you know, you make the arrest and you don't really think much of it. You don't investigate beyond that. But this officer, as you said, had a hunch and took it one step farther. They wanted to uh, call in the detectives and then obviously the the search incident to arrest where they revealed the 9mm really really sent off some flags. So kudos to the officers who took them homicidal subject off yeah. the street, right? And is I that is that a proper appropriate thing yeah, to say? Yeah, I would, I, that's how I would describe it. I don't know if it's appropriate, but that's how I would describe it. And the lead detective, whose name escapes me, and I apologize for that, uh, he did an excellent job getting Matthew to trust him, which was no small feat because this is somebody who's suffering paranoid delusions and isn't trusting anyone, right? Getting Matthew to, to eventually open up. Yeah. Uh, that, that's so much skill to the to investigator, trained investigators, interrogators. Oh, abs- absolutely. I mean, uh, and it starts, I always say, at the at the uniform patrol level. I mean, I'm a very pro street cop. Uh, yeah, and, you know, if an officer worth his weight in salt or her weight in salt, they will do these follow-ups. That's so important in any in any profession. You do the follow-up work. You do you you do the extra walk that extra mile, and it, and it, it reaps benefits. Because I'll tell you what, if this officer wasn't there at that time, and he just carried on and went his own way, you know, pushing the cart. Mm-hmm. There probably would. I mean, let's just speculation. There may have been more homicides down the road. Let's just yeah. put it down. Well, well in, the, in the police files, mm-hmm. right, the, the ones that have been revealed or opened, the, there, is, there is a notation that Matthew may have been planning another one. Don't know. It hasn't been confirmed. Uh, another homicide, right? Because he was so delusional at the moment. He thought that the voices were telling him, these people want to kill you. These people want to rape you, as you said, doctor. Mm-hmm. And, and that's that's a good question to ask. If he felt this way with these two victims, mm-hmm. d- does it occur on occasion where they can say, okay, I'm better now. I, there's no more threats. I'm done. Or will that person continue to think that there's threats all around? And listen, I already got rid of two people. I got to get rid of everybody else to safeguard myself. Well, it, it's interesting because in another case that I worked on, that individual that was in a different jurisdiction he believed that the two in that case he killed two women family members that they were still a threat to him he didn't believe that they were dead right and so i think in maybe in some cases it's possible that they say okay i'm safe now but i think it's more likely that because of the paranoia Mm -hmm. and the the delusions and hallucinations that that isn't what happens as long as they're not on proper medication. So it's great to make a distinction right now, right? That not all people who suffer from schizophrenia, just like not all people who have mental illness or some type of mental disease are criminal homicidal. Correct. Right? Uh, this is this is a case where, where untreated schizophrenia led this individual to commit homicide. Yes. In the last two minutes of, of the show that we have here, uh, for anybody experiencing or anybody that's witnessing another person experiencing such difficulties, what advice would you give them? That's a really great question. It's really difficult. Uh, to do the best that they can to try to get the person help from a qualified psychiatrist, something with a, um, with a psychotic disorder, 
really requires a psychiatrist. Um, a psychologist can do counseling, but this is a disorder that requires medication, and a psychologist cannot write prescriptions, right? So that individual really needs to be seen by a qualified medical doctor, which is going to be a psychiatrist. And that is one of the social dilemmas that we have because psychiatrists are not cheap, and if you don't have health insurance, right, that becomes an issue. But in Miami, we do have... We have Jackson Crisis Center. We have um, community mental health centers that are underfunded, but they do exist. And so if somebody is actively psychotic, the, these are the places to get them to go, um, especially if you don't have health insurance, mm -hmm. but the person needs treatment. David? You know, I, I started today talking about the sweater. It's this time of year right now, and you mm -hmm. have seasonal disorder, too. Yes. I think, you know, just to be more focused, not just on what we talked about today, but mental health as a whole. This is that time of year where things can just escalate uh, a little bit more, I, I'm thinking. I, uh, and maybe you can just touch upon that. That That is true. Holidays will tend to exacerbate symptoms. Mm -hmm. It also bears mentioning that individuals with severe depression or certain types of bipolar disorder, they call it bipolar depression, um, can also suffer from psychotic episodes. Uh, those, you know, hallucinations, those sorts of things. Um, not at the same level or with not necessarily the same level of intensity as somebody with schizophrenia, particularly paranoid type. But if someone is feeling desperate and they're, they're seeing or hearing things that they think may not be there, um, or they're seeing or hearing things that they think are there and are a threat to them, that they should also go take themselves to get help at their nearest community mental health or crisis center. Yeah. And given that we now have a broader audience because we're up on the, the uh, podcast platforms like Spotify, Google, YouTube, iHeart, Apple, um, we want you to let everyone know that if you call the police, whatever jurisdiction you're in, for either yourself or a loved one that's gone through mental distress, uh, please ask the call taker, the dispatcher that you're speaking with, to send an officer or officers who are trained either in CIT or some type of mental health recognition training. Very, very important. Uh, usually the outcomes are a little bit better that yes. way. So on that note, we ask you guys to drop us a line. Let us know if you have any thoughts, any ideas for future shows. Doctor, we can't thank you enough. My co-host, I can't thank you enough. Rachel, nice. our producer behind the scenes, we thank you as much as we thank the Miami's Community News team. Um, but you, the audience you make this show happen. So look for you next time. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. I know I have. Thank you. Thank you. We'll talk to you next time.